HIPAA is cybersecurity, sort of. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Uh, and today we have a co-presenter, Deborah Leva, VP of Business Development for Three Lions Publishing, is going to be uh, taking us through the compliance uh, equation. We also uh, have some distinguished panelists. Um, Deborah is going to be a panelist as well throughout the presentation. Brent Brighton, uh, the most badass IP technology lawyer I know, second to me of course, um, is unfortunately not going to be here. He couldn't make it at the last minute. Um, and Chris Sa, aka Winston, Winston Wolf, if you're a Pulp Fiction fan, um, you, you've probably, if you've heard our webinars before, you, you, you probably know that Chris has been a guest panelist um, on several occasions. He also could not make it at the last minute. And uh, we have John um, Levy uh, substituting for Winston Wolf. John, are you on? And un unfortunately, John is having some technical problems right now, so he might he might uh, pop in later. Uh, and Martin Gwynn, our Director of Operations, as always, is going to be trolling the chat for questions. We're going to take questions as we go, like we normally do. Um, and so at appropriate time, he will stop me and uh, ask me the questions, or I may stop and take a breath and ask him, are there any questions? Uh, and then we'll take Q&A at the end as well. So I'm going to do a little introduction to set the stage because we're going to be covering a lot of ground here. A lot of it is nuanced. A lot of it is probably um, HIPAA concepts and abstractions that you, you've really never thought about before in this particular way. At least I, I don't think you have. And I, you know, I've, been, I've been doing this for a long, long time. And then Deborah is going to uh, present the compliance equation, which is really a common denominator for cybersecurity, um, for cybersecurity really across the board. Okay, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're trying to do cybersecurity in financial services business. It doesn't matter if you're trying to do it, you know, for whatever particular industry uh, you're doing, banking, healthcare. Uh, and it's the it's the NIST equation that that we productized. We borrowed from SP 800-5-30 Rev 1. Okay, and NIST uh, that's how NIST recommends that risk assessments be done, and it's totally industry agnostic because NIST is the sort of the consultant that advises all the government agencies, U.S. government agencies, on how to do risk assessment. Okay, so it's not really uh, uh, HIPAA specific. We just borrowed it, and and really, you know, our our competitor, every competitor I know that has done a SaaS program like Espresso has borrowed the equation. I don't think they explain it in the same way we do, uh, but uh, it, to my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, everybody's borrowed that particular uh, equation because it's kind of the Bible. And we're going to talk about technical versus legal compliance, which I think is a really, really challenging area because a lot of technical people don't understand that even if they're doing a lot of the technical things correct, they're still not legally compliant, okay? Or they might ask, well, wait a minute, I did all this stuff for PCI DSS, how come it doesn't work for HIPAA? And we're going to, we're going to explore that because I think it's, it's just an area that causes a lot of confusion. We're also going to talk about some various mapping, mapping mechanisms that are out there like ISO 2701 and uh, high trust and why in some cases they can really be problematic. These are the, this technical versus legal challenge, just, okay? So the mapping mechanism sometimes can add a layer of, of obfuscation and not really provide um, that much clarity, okay? And then we're going to talk about, you know, how we're all fishing for answers in this river of social complexity or why HIPAA compliance, compliance in general, but what, you know, we're focused on HIPAA today, 
why HIPAA compliance is so challenging. So the learning objectives today is provide um, Yes. I have one quick question, and it's a good one concerning what you were talking about. Carlos, do you have any thoughts on why more folks aren't adopting SP300 R2 and still cling to the R1 approach to conducting a risk assessment? SP800-30 Rev. Um, um, what was the SP, uh, It says 300. It should probably meant 800. I'm not, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of. I'm not aware of. Rev, if it's if it's 800, if it's special publication 800-30 Rev 2, I, I'm not aware of Rev 2. Okay, then it's SP 300. Yeah, then I'm. You know, S, I, 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 I'm not. I'm not sure what SP 300 is. If you know, if. Um, um, you know, if they can type in the chat, what is what is the title of SP three hundred? They're going to look for it online. It was updated around two thousand and twelve. Um, I may be thinking of another document. Risk management guide is what I'm getting. Well, yes. Yeah, see, that, I mean, NIST has all kinds of special publications. You know how to implement, you know, guide to implement the security rule, guide to this, that. Risk management, you know, they have a, a guide for risk management, which is really the risk management program, which if you get into the security rule, is is the second implementation specification of standard one, okay? And, it, it, you know, and, and they, you know, in the risk management program, they do talk about risk assessments because because that's the first step in risk management is to do a risk assessment. So for whatever reason, HHS wound up putting risk assessments in two different implementation specifications. One that stands alone under the first standard, and I'm talking about the administrative safeguards, right? So one that stands alone, and then one that is part of the risk management program, which is kind of the life cycle of your HIPAA compliance initiative, which is assess, you know, then simplify, then implement, then monitor, then, you know, assess again, right? This is this life cycle. So, um, so we, in our products, we use various different uh, NIST documents as references. But as far as I know, uh, for a conducting a risk assessment, 830 Rev. 1 is, is the Bible. Okay, so anyway, we want to understand a theoretical underpinning of, or we want you, you know, the, to understand the need for theoretical underpinning and understanding of risk assessments. Why, what, why do you have to do it? Why are they so important? Okay, and then understanding this divide, the technical legal divide, which is at times really maddening in, in, in how confusing uh, it is. Understand why the mac why the mac me me mechanisms may obfuscate, right? Why why do they, why do they cause some uh, confusion, and why why do you need to be aware of them? Now, there may be reasons that you need to go there. Mostly, probably from a marketing perspective, if some big client says you have to have ISO, you know, twenty seven zero zero one or high trust, right? But you need to understand. The, the the challenges that you may have if you go down that road. And when we're talking about social complexity, we're talking about, really we're talking about wicked problems. And wicked problems are, are, are problems that have more social organizational complexity than they do technical complexity. And I would make the argument, and we've been making the argument a long time, as much technical complexity as there is in HIPAA, it has much more uh, organizational complexity, okay, and that's why a lot of times it doesn't get implemented, budgets aren't sufficient, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's changing slowly, but um, you know, even even if, if it changes more rapidly, it's it's still going to have more organizational complexity than technical complexity. So we are, you know, we have the bad guys fishing to get our data. And we as practitioners are fi are fishing to better understand how we grapple with this thing called HIPAA, right? And hopefully today we're going to give you some insights. Everything we talk about is going to affect 
uh, has the potential of, of affecting the three-legged triangle, right, of the privacy rule, the security rule, uh, and the breach notification rule. And this is the compliance equation, okay? I'm gonna, this is just an introduction. I'm going to let Debbie take you step by step through it. But in Espresso, this is how we calculate a risk. A risk is the probability of a threat, a particular threat, exploiting a particular vulnerability times the impact to your business if, in fact, that occurred, right? So let's say, for example, the vulnerability is you have no disaster recovery plan. The threat is a hurricane, some weather, Katrina, if that were to happen, right, what's the probability of that happening? Um, if you have no disaster recovery plan, obviously the probability is probably is going to be higher than what would be the impact to your business if that happened, okay? That's the equation, although it is a far more complex uh, than what meets the eye, and Debbie's going to take you step by step through that, and this comes out of 800, special publication 830 Rev 1. Okay, the legal technical divide is really the nuanced difference between the two. The nuanced difference between the two is so insidious and tractable that few lawyers, consultants, CISOs, etc., fundamentally grok it. Okay, it's it's because it's because there's so much technical and um, social, organizational, and legal complexity, okay? And the legal part is also part of the social complexity, okay? So you may know what you're doing technically and you, you know, you went through this PCI DSS exercise, you plugged your firewall, you made the right changes, you did the right things through all your routers, you know, and then the question comes up, how come that doesn't apply to, to HIPAA? And the answer is, well, it does apply to HIPAA, but HIPAA's got all this other stuff that you got to do to be in compliance as well. And something like PCI DSS is, is prescriptive, okay? They say they have 12 requirements, but underneath those 12 requirements, they have dozens sometimes of sub-requirements. So you, have, you end up having about 120 or 130 requirements, but those are detailed, prescriptive requirements. Go do this and this and this to your router. Go do X, Y, and Z. Plug, open this port, close this port on, on your firewalls. You know? And then when you get to HIPAA, HIPAA is descriptive. HIPAA just tells you what to do. It doesn't tell you how to do it, right? And so you're in a completely different universe, even though fundamentally they're both cybersecurity. Okay, these are the mapping mechanisms that we're going to explore a little bit as to why um, they may cause some difficulty. And we're going to spend some time on, on this topic that I think is really, really important, this dealing with the social complexity, dealing with your organization, dealing with your CEO or the C-suite, if, if they're still living in the 20th century when HIPAA was an unforced paper tiger and, you know, now they're starting to wake up because of WannaCry and Petya and all these million-dollar fines, and but they don't know where to go, you know what I mean? And so you have this challenge if you're a compliance officer or counsel is, is to explain to them what's that issue, what it could do to the reputation of the organization, how important it is, and then moreover, how you're going to go about solving the problem. What is the methodology? And we just put this together from, uh, Debbie put this, Deborah put this together uh, just recently from um, the wall of shame. Okay, and I think it was the wall of shame. No, it was yeah, it was the wall of shame and the enforcement. It's actually it's not listed on the wall of shame. We were we were hoping it was, but the, the monetary penalties are not listed on the wall of shame. You have to actually go to the enforcement page. And so for 2017 and 2016, these are the fines that were paid. Okay, and you could go read about the individual cases, and they range from large organizations to small organizations. And you can see some big fines on this page, 5.5 million, right? Um, and in what? In these two years, HHS uh, collected $28 million in fines. HHS has said since, I think since the High Tech Act was promulgated in 20, 
09, they've collected $72 million in fines. Now, we'll cover this later, but HHS has a virtual money machine because the High Tech Act said all that money that was created in, uh, not really fines, really called civil monetary penalties because this isn't criminal, but lay people, we call it fines, right? They, they, all these civil monetary penalties go back into HHS's coffers for more enforcement. So HHS has no lack of funds to enforce even more aggressively if they chose to. And, and I believe for various reasons that we're going to discuss that they may turn up the heat and start um, start enforcing more aggressively. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah. She's going to walk you through understanding the Espresso compliance equation, which is really the equation that we borrowed from from NIST SP 800-30 Rev 1. Deborah? I'm here. Uh, do we need to transfer the screen over to me or how are we going to do this? Yes, Martin, so can you share the screen with um, Deborah? Yes, I can do that. John Levy, did you manage to get on and uh, we have your yes, audio? Sir. Yes. Uh, John, yes, welcome. I believe so. Can you hear me? Uh, now we can hear you. Yeah, we've been uh, we were trying to get you before. I don't know what happened. So John Levy is from is from TechFac and uh, is substituting for uh, Chris, uh, aka Winston Wolf today. So John, why don't you give us like just a you know a hundred foot view of your bio, like your background, and so forth. I uh, certainly thanks. I uh, came out of college and went to work for uh, one of the not not the big six, but our next year down a uh, public accounting firm, and had a successful career in management consulting to commercial real estate, construction, nonprofit, and state and local government clients. And then uh, for the past 22 years, I've been an IT leader in a couple public and private companies. Uh, one was a real estate investment trust. Another was a, is a national real estate investment management firm. And uh, the last one was uh, Cassidy Turley, which is now Christian Wakefield. For the last three years, I've been a, a senior uh, person at TechFac doing business strategy analysis, IT strategic planning, and uh, actually involved in some stock audits for a large healthcare software provider up in New England. And uh, TechFac and Chris Saw and I are very excited about working with Carlos and his team on the Expresso product and providing sort of some of the IT foundational uh, security assessments and remediation services to clients that need help in those areas. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um... Yeah, and we're going to talk about the partnership with TechFact later on. We're going to talk about Pulse and Heartbeat and some of the um, uh, offerings that um, um, TechFact has. Now, Deborah, you still have the you still have, you you still have the screen, right? No, um, there's a, there we go. Now we have the screen. Well. You, <laughs> Deborah, go ahead. Because I got a, I got a, I got a message saying show my screen, which I'm going to get out of. Okay, Deborah. So we lost Deborah. Apparently, uh, it looks. Uh, let's go back. Uh, um, she's offline, as far as I can tell. All right. Well, do, do we have any questions? We'll get her back here in a second. Yes, we do. Um, one question about risk assessments, um, and the question is, is this to boil the ocean, is this a boil the ocean approach for the entire, entire global enterprise, or can we do assessments on a per application or per data center basis? Uh, no, you, you, uh, you can do assessments at whatever organizational level that you want in fact I I would I wouldn't re I wouldn't recommend that you boil the ocean man it 
you're going to boil the ocean, you probably might get caught up in that uh, in, in in that stew and get burned up as well. I, I, no, I would take it a at, at a granular level, you know, and maybe at a department level, and then you know, so so espresso, for example, allows you to do as many risk assessments as um, as you like. Okay, and we'll 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 store. Uh, we'll store those for you historically. So, looks like Deborah, you're back. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, well, there you go. Um, okay. Thank you, you, Carlos. Sorry, everyone, about the little difficulty there. We so got we're going to talk. We, we got we got to see you a little bit. You clicked on the. Yeah, that was sad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That was All sad. Right. You can see me scratching my head, going, "What the heck?" Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't okay. what your lips were saying. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about espresso and the compliance equation. Basically, we, when you're thinking about compliance, there's really four steps involved. You know, you assess your risks, you remediate and mitigate those risks, and repeat. It's not a once and done activity, and we'll talk about that. We say number one, we provide you with Expresso to do your risk assessment. And we have had people who have actually done it in three hours or less with my assistance or with someone else's assistance. And what we find out after we do the baseline risk assessment is we've identified high risks and we take a look at those and we analyze what is our remediation choices. I will show you um, slides that contain our scorecards that not only tell you what the action item is that you have to comply with or the control, this implementation standard, but also a description of that standard and then an opportunity for you to score how well you feel you have you have complied with that particular item. And then we also provide you with remediation documents like model documents that you can customize and use for your organization like a disaster recovery plan or a uh, document model document you can use for patients who request revisions or access to their PHI. I hey, say let, me, a, let, me, let me jump in and, and say just a couple comments and this is probably going to be true for every every slide. So, um, um, so you can just kind of throw it to me after you present a little bit because I've I've gone through and I'm I'm like okay yeah when Debbie does her thing I want to say a few things about what what you said. One of the things is and and it's great that we had this boil the ocean uh, question because the reason that people can do a risk assessment in three hours or less with espresso and I, I think if we get to the right point later we will show you the secret sauce but we preload espresso with 160 risks threat vulnerability pairs already matched up okay and those threat vulnerability pairs are also matched up to controls that you could implement in fact all 43 controls that the security rule requires are embedded in Espresso out of the box and, and your job is to go figure out what you have in place of those 43 controls, what you don't have in place and then you know rank them high, medium or low on those 160 risks. Okay? And what we did is, is since we knew we couldn't boil the ocean, we, we took the threats and we aggregated them into threat categories. Okay essentially nine threat categories because if you go out to like IBM's X-Force website they list 400,000 or more vectors for example as to how somebody could hack your network enter your network right that 400,000 threat vectors is just too uh, too big a number to deal with so we said look we're just gonna call this social engineering or intrusion right fishing or intrusion because really at some level we don't care how you got in we care that you got in and what we're gonna do after that okay and so we rationalize that boiling ocean into uh, nine threat categories 
and then we matched up certain vulnerabilities with those threats and those vulnerabilities will apply to the security rule vis-a-vis -vis controls the way Debbie uh, is going to illustrate uh, in, in these upcoming slides. Okay. And that's, abso that's absolutely right, Carlos. And, you know, we say, I said it was not a once and done activity. We have, we have clients who will then repeat their risk assessments when they get new hardware or if the office is moved somewhere else. And that's when you should repeat your risk assessment because you may find that there are other risks that you hadn't thought about the first time that you went through the system. One last comment here about doing a risk assessment in three hours or less is that the other reason that that that, that is possible, okay, and I know our competitors say snake oil, but and then you know uh, if I were a competitor I might say the same thing, right, but the other reason that that's true is that we don't boil the ocean. So we don't make you enter all your security objects, all your devices, all your phones, all your servers, all your workforce. All, we don't make you enter those security objects before you complete the first line, baseline risk assessment. Why? Because you could spend months entering all that inventory and you still haven't gotten to identifying those high risks. Okay? We say that it's preferable to identify the high risk, start remediating those risks in the real world, right, and then go back and, and enter your security objects over time as you have a chance, all right? We, we think it's more important and that an auditor would think it's more important and that a court of law would think it's more important that you got busy remediating where you were lacking than spending six or seven months and having the most beautiful inventory uh, in the system, but yet you haven't identified the first, even the first high risk item, okay? And we do allow you to mass import your security objects via a CSV file, and we have a, a taxonomy for categorizing your security objects, which we provide, but you are free to change, okay? So we do deal with security objects, I think, in a fairly elegant way, but we don't force you to implement that, uh, you know, import all those security objects before you get started. So I, I think just right here we've covered a lot of ground. Martin, are, are there any questions? Not at this time. Okay. All right, so we'll move along. Thank you, Carlos. Those are good points that you just made. So, again, we have guidance from HHS for conducting a risk analysis. And if you noticed on the slide that Carlos showed you with the monetary civil penalties, that one of the uh, covered entities on the list had not done a risk analysis and they had a uh, million dollar fine. So it is true that if you don't have one, you're in willful neglect. And so let's talk about how you can get one really fast. So the risk is the combination of a threat and a vulnerability. Carlos gave the example of a threat being a hurricane and the vulnerability being lack of a disaster recovery plan. Well, that lack of a disaster recovery plan really points to the control that's actually in the regulation. So by virtue of the fact that you need to have one in the regulations and it states that that's a mandatory requirement, if you don't have it, it becomes a vulnerability. And then, of course, the impact to your organization. If you have a disaster recovery plan and you're prepared to handle a hurricane, then the impact to your organization could be low. If no, no, not, no, 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 that's a little confusing. So the impact, the impact could still be high, okay? Because if, if, if the, if the, even if you had a disaster, even if you had the best disaster recovery plan, if, if the threat actually, if the threat actually, um, uh, you exploited. know, exploited that, that vulnerability, right. right? Despite the fact that, that you had the best disaster recovery plan and you, you know what I mean? Other things happened, it, you know, the impact could still be high, but the risk could be low because you have a 
the threat, the, the, the probability of the threat exploiting the vulnerability as low. Okay? It, it, so you could have the impact could still remain high because if it did happen and you had all this bad stuff happen, despite the fact that you had a what you thought was a great control, it could still be high, but the risk could still be low. Now, this is all subjective. This is all these are the decisions that you have to make in Espresso for those 160 risks that we provide you, right? We, we will provide you a combination of, okay, a weather event and no disaster recovery. What would it, then what would it do to your organization? And you're assigning probabilities of high, medium, or low to the probability that the threat will exploit the vulnerability. So it looks like math, but it's really not math. It's subjective high, medium, or low, and then the impact to your organization if it were to happen, high, medium, or low, and then the risks based on these factors, also high, medium, or low, okay? So it's completely subjective, but this is the part that we can't do for you, no, nor can any other vendor. You gotta think hard about, whoa, okay, what if this happened in my organization? What would it, what would it mean? Okay. Okay. Good explanation. Thank you there. So we'll start with risks. Carlos has already said that what we end up with and the ultimate goal of going through the process is to assign a probability of the risk happening and its impact to the organization. So an overall risk level could be high, medium, or low. A probability of high, medium, or low also applies to the threat, which in the, the example Carlos gave is a hurricane, exploiting the vulnerability that we said was lack of a disaster recovery plan. So again, high, medium, or low. Some sample TV pairs, as we call them, could be, Carlos already said, social engineering or intrusion. Um, a vulnerability could be the lack of a, a data backup plan. We could have weather disasters, power outages, theft of lost devices, and, and if you notice on that list, there were a number of lost devices that did, um, that did receive uh, civil monetary penalties because there was PHI that was not encrypted on those devices. Right. And I mean, that's one of the that's one of the big ways that you get you get fined is that you have PHI on a mobile device, on a pad, on a PC, on a laptop. It's unencrypted. That thing gets stolen or lost. Now you got a breach, okay? And if you had a even a small breach of five thousand records and a conservative estimate of two hundred dollars per record, which the Panama Institute says for healthcare. It's like now. It's like uh, I think I think it's like four hundred dollars per record. Let's just say it was two hundred dollars per record and five thousand records. That's a million dollars right there in just notification costs. We're not talking about HHS coming in and whacking you with fines or, or CM or CMPs. So you're, you you can see how easily how easily you can get up into the millions when you have some um, you know some laptop walk out the door that has. PS, P, uh, PHI on and unencrypted. We actually say that mobile devices shouldn't have any PHI on them at all. They should just be access only devices. Then by exception, if they have PHI, they have to have PHI, then that PHI has got to be encrypted, right, when it's not in use. And then obviously then you have to follow all the training that says, okay, look, you've got a laptop that's got PHI, Obviously, when you're using it, a spreadsheet or whatever that's got PHI, it's unencrypted. And you're at Starbucks, don't walk away for 15 minutes with, with your laptop unencrypted uh, because somebody could just walk in and then start stealing it, steal it and start using it, right? It's unencrypted now and uh, it, it's all good. Now, you know, I went down a rabbit hole a little bit about mobile devices because that's one of the big areas where, you know, it's easy to solve. But the healthcare industry won't solve that easily because they won't implement this policy of mobile devices should only be access only. But I want to point out one thing here about the vulnerabilities because this this is a really nuanced concept that you gotta you gotta really think about it three or four times before you get it. And hopefully you get it 
as part of this uh, webinar. But this no data backup plan, this no incident reporting, this no boundary defense, every one of these things is a requirement from the security rule. The security rule says you got to have a data backup plan. If you don't have a data backup plan, it's a vulnerability. The security rule says you have to have an incident reporting mechanism. If you don't have one, it's a vulnerability. So we define a vulnerability as the absence of a security control, right? And although the, the HIPAA security rule calls these things implementation specifications, the industry no longer calls them that. These are nothing more than security controls, all right? So the fact that that should be one of the biggest takeaways from today's webinar, that a vulnerability the definition of a vulnerability, and Debbie's got a slide on this, is the absence of a control. And here, what we, in, in, in Espresso, the controls that we list, or the absence thereof, and then we link them to the control, are what we've said is the 43 security controls or the 43 implementation specifications that the HIPAA security rule says you have to implement. And we didn't, we took them all whether they were required or addressable, because that's another sort of nuanced thing, but even the addressable ones you have to implement in some way, shape, or form. Okay, Deborah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so threats. I think Carlos kind of touched on this, but there are things that can potentially cause financial and reputational damage to your organization because they can expose your information to risks or your PHI to risks. So in this case, the threat of a hurricane, if you were um, in Louisiana, then you couldn't get to the office and someone else could potentially get access to your information. So during, so during Katrina, I'm actually from New Orleans and, and, and um, my family actually lived through that. I wasn't in, in New Orleans at the time, but my my, my mom and my sisters uh, were there and they had to be rescued, actually. But 70% of uh, doctor's offices lost records during Katrina, and the same amount for lawyers, actually. So Katrina was a disaster in a million different ways, but it was also a disaster to um, covered entities because they actually lost lots of their data. They weren't prepared. They didn't have backups, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was 2005. That was before, you know, that was before um, high, the High Tech Act. That was before HIPAA had any teeth. Uh, but you might imagine another disaster like that in the healthcare industry, still largely with their head in the sand, what kind of fines uh, would emerge from, from a Katrina-like event? So not only do we have natural threats, which could be the, the, the floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, but we also have threats that are enabled or caused by humans. They may be intentional or unintentional, but in either case they could expose or, or provide access unauthorized to PHI. And then we have environmental threats, power failures, pollutions, pollution, etc. So there are various different kinds of threats. So we all know that the insider threat, the human being, is one of the most insidious types of threats to try to track, right? We just saw a report today of uh, a clerk having um, reviewing PHI for 14 years before um, she was caught uh, or he was caught. Uh, and um, it's just hard to figure out who's looking at data. I mean, obviously, the security rule says you need to uh, provide access on the need-to-know basis, you know, uh, minimum necessary principle, yada, yada. Obviously, that wasn't followed, but the, the, the ability to detect the fact that somebody was actually an insider was actually misusing PHI's insidious and, and intractable problem to try to solve. And, so those kinds of threats in Espresso, we just bundled them and said, this is exfiltration. This is threats from the inside, PHI getting out from the inside. And obviously, we have lots of incidents 
and, and lots of uh, breaches that have happened because you have a a bad actor on the inside that is doing stuff for you know for uh, financial reasons or for uh, you know uh, looking at looking at a celebrity's uh, PHI when they shouldn't be looking at it, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So their their exfiltration is 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 one of the bigger is one of the bigger threats and one of the bigger challenges to try to to try to solve. That's why what that's why your workforce in Espresso is actually part of security objects. It's not just and, and part of your inventory. If you were to think about security objects as inventory, part of that is your workforce. Every single person in your workforce, you you apply controls to them. What kind of controls do you apply to your workforce? Well generally it's processes, right, that you implemented, policies that they have to sign, and training. Okay, those so so your workforce is a security object uh, in Espresso. It's not just servers, devices, etc. Well, that's true, and it's also potentially like we've heard recently about the WannaCry and Petya malicious software uploads that can infiltrate your your environment and ha get access to various PHI, no matter where it resides. Vulnerabilities, we spoke about a disaster recovery plan and as Carlos said, it is the absence of a control or security rule implementation specification. And I say here also refer to NIST Special Publication 800-30 Rev 1. Now, to be honest with you, um, yes, this the, the NIST document is the Bible, but the vulnerability being the absence of a control was some uh, aha moment that we had. It was an epiphany when we were trying to work out this equation. We were like, well, what is this thing of vulnerability? How do we really define it? And we were like, oh, okay, yeah. Almost by definition, it's an absence of a control. Okay, so the beautiful thing about this equation that, that the people at NIST came up is that it, it's elegant mathematically. It's a tautology almost. If you follow it, you're in compliance by definition because we identify all 43 controls, okay, that you have to implement from the security rule. And then you go down that list and you say, well, which one of these have we implemented or haven't we implemented it? And to what degree? You know, are we really satisfied that the control is doing its job? You know, and that, that also figures into whether the risk remains high, medium, uh, or, or low. Okay, so this concept of, again, the vulnerability being the absence of a control is really critical to understanding uh, the equation, critical to understanding how Espresso works. Okay. So here's an example directly from the regula regulations of HIPAA 164.308 administrative safeguards under the security rule where it says that a, at the bottom you can see a disaster recovery plan is one of the required implementation specifications or control and it says the how it says you have to establish and implement as needed procedures to restore loss of data it doesn't tell you how you're going to go about doing that it just says that's what you need to have, the what, not the how. And if you look at, if you go back, Debbie, if you look at, you know, this contingency plan standard, okay, it actually has A, B, C, and D, okay? A, data backup plan, that's also a control and required, all right? C is an emergency mode operations plan, okay? And D is some... Uh, tracking of your critical applications so that you know which application to restore first, second, or third, right? Because you had an emergency, Katrina hit, you're just trying to get up and running so that you can serve your patients, right? So what is more important? Do you need your financial system up? Well, maybe, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is probably getting your EHR system up so you can get your patient's PHI and be able to look at them and then apply the right treatments, diagnosis, et cetera, right? So all these specific pieces we identify. So we tell you 
if you have it, then you have the control in place. If you don't have it, then you have to remediate that and do that thing. Create the data backup plan. Create the disaster recovery plan. Now, we have tools and templates. We have over 30 products that help you remediate. But this is really the baseline risk assessment is identifying those things that you're missing. Okay, and to identify those things that you're missing, you don't need to spend six months entering all your inventory. Okay, that's the magic sauce, right, of implementing, of doing a baseline risk assessment. Because a risk assessment really you ought to be doing at a minimum once a year, probably once a quarter. And the rule says, well, okay, yes, you should do it periodically. You should do it if uh, there's some material change to your environment, like a like a, a merger. You should do it, for example, if you move, if you move your uh, data center, right? There was a big fine issued about five years ago where uh, there was a data center move. These tapes got lost and stolen. Um, actually, it was a government agency. I can't remember the particular one. And, you know, the argument was, well, it's too old. The bad guys aren't going to be able to read those old tapes. It was like, no, you know, the, the bad guys will find out a way to read those old tapes and you got a problem and they got whacked with a millions of dollars worth of fine, right? So there are certain things that the rule says, but periodically, if you're not doing a risk assessment, for example, the two biggest things that came out of WannaCry and Petya from HHS is encrypt, 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 okay? It, it, because if somebody locks you out, uh, they can still lock you out if you're encrypted. But if you have backups, then you can say, well, we'll just start over. We'll wipe out that server, and we'll start over with our backups, and now you're good, right? So encrypt, 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 because if you encrypt, they can lock you out, but they haven't taken your PHI. And do you have, do you have an effective disaster recovery plan? But notice, that's not enough. The standard is contingency plan. Do you have a data backup plan? Do you have a disaster recovery plan? You have, if we were showing C, you have an emergency mode operations plan and so forth, right? The requirement is a lot more granular than just a disaster recovery plan. That's true. That's true. And then we talked about I being the impact to your organization. An impact by definition refers to the adverse event effect that a specific threat that exploited a vulnerability may have on your organization. And also during your risk assessment you will um, determine subjectively whether it is high, medium, or low of an impact to your organization, which could change obviously if you have new people coming in or if you move your, your offices as, car as we discussed. So that could change as well. Let me give you an example. Let's say you had a really, really good disaster recovery plan, right? You had even tested it real time, which most most medium sized to small covered entities and business associates don't have the luxury to do because testing a disaster recovery plan is really, really an expense. Testing it real time, like actually bringing your systems down on a weekend and, and going through and pretending, simulating like you've had a Katrina-like event, is a really, really expensive thing to do. So most small to medium-sized covered entities uh, and business associates will simulate, simulate um, you know, a, a disaster, but they'll do it what we call with tabletop testing. You, you know, you kind of go through it like it's happening, but you didn't really actually bring uh, your systems down. And John, I'm, I'm just curious, if, have you been involved in any, like, real, um, you know, disaster. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, can you uh, speak, can totally, we were a, a, a soccer. Right. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, go, go ahead. I think I was okay. talking over so, you. Cassie, totally, we were a stock audit organization in order to, to attain and retain business with, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase and other big financial institutions. Our IT, uh, accounting and uh, parts of uh, HR were SOC audited, including all of our, our on-premise data centers and so forth. And it was a you know a year-long process of getting ready to be audited. 
and you know there were multiple risk principles and so forth and trust principles that uh, were part of that audit and we did not as we talked about before try to boil the ocean we actually did uh, partial year audits for the first year as we sort of grew into continuous auditing but um, yeah the 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 getting ready to be audited and being compliant is is as important a process as the actual audit and it's not something you want to leap into you want to be very deliberate and plan and execute no exactly and did you guys as part of that process what did you guys um, what, what oh, did you well, have to do so with the actual disaster DR recovery? testing yeah so for DR testing we did sort of three types of tests we did tabletop tests, which is really a simulation of a disaster, right. and that right. was really to get down our scripts and our uh, people helping people understand their roles. Right. Because there's a communication right. role, there's an execution role, and so forth. And then we did application-specific DR testing, where we would flip from primary to failover and fail back. And the okay. testing the right. fail back is just as important. And then we would do sort of you know, full on, you know, pretend that, the, you know, a nuclear bomb went off on top of the primary data center and we had to flip everything, which right. involved all the communications and network communications. And we did those every year and we actually invited uh, our our clients that essentially contractually requires to, to be audited to actually come and not only observe but participate in those tests. Because in right. many cases we had real time or near, near real time interfaces with their back office systems. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. It, it, right. it was, it was uh, we had a project manager that was at least 50% focused on DR testing and it was a, you know, a year long uh, process that happened every year and, you know, there were multiple, multiple test sessions. So it's, it is a, an important validation that your plan and your scripts actually work. Yeah, it's enormously, and you can tell from what John was describing that. Now, John, how big an organization, like revenue, run rate, and how many employees? You, I mean, you're describing a a yeah a big organization. Yeah, right? revenue was like yeah, it was. We were, uh, you know, it, it, in 2014, we were about 5,000 people, and you know, 800 million in revenue, um, right. in operations, and you know, over 40 states. So yeah, it was a big organization. So you can you can imagine the, just the enormity of testing that disaster recovery plan, year long planning, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, now the the security rule has this thing called the flexibility principle that says you have to implement the rule and all of its controls, aka implementation specifications. But you can you can uh, apply certain factors. The size of your organization, the sophistication of your organization, the amount of resources that you have, right? So you can you can do this within the context of those of those factors, right? Those flexibility principles, which means that if you're a small or medium-sized covered entity, you're not going to be able to do what John described, right? They, it just you can't afford it, right? And and it, and it's just impractical. But you that doesn't mean that you can't that you can walk away from being able to at least tabletop test your disaster recovery plan and you know uh, invoke who's doing what, what are the roles, and what if John Smith is missing, who's his backup, and and going through that process, HHS is going to want to know: Did you table? First of all, do you have a disaster recovery plan? Yes. Well, did you test it? Did you at least, at a minimum, tabletop test it? If you didn't do that, then you're going to get whacked. Right, because it's that it's that important. Now, I just want to give you a scenario here where, let's say you had a great, let's say you had a great, um, let's say you had a great disaster recovery plan. You were doing what John's organization was doing. You know, you tested, you flipped, you failed back, etc. Right, and but for whatever reason, you didn't have for whatever reason Katrina hit, and in a particular data center. Maybe it was a small satellite office or something. You didn't have a backup generator, or your backup generator uh, because you lost electricity. Your backup generator failed, and you didn't have a backup to the backup. Now, 
what is the impact of your organization? The impact of your organization still could be potentially high, okay? But now, if the vulnerability, I mean, so that's a possibility. If that happened, it would be high. You can't, you can't really think about every single possibility, but if you've done the kind of testing that John's organization did, or you've done rigorous tabletop tests and you just didn't play for 45 minutes, you actually spent a half a day tabletop testing and going through it, then you can say, you know what, we feel pretty good that we have this vulnerability covered. Yes, if it happened, the impact would be high, but the probability of the threat exploiting the vulnerability we feel is medium or low, and therefore we're going to give the risk a medium or low uh, um, score instead of a high score, right? Because what we're talking about at the end of the day is you identify those high risk, and those are the ones that you attack first. Okay, Deborah. Sorry. Nope. No problem. Good. Good uh, dialogue. Okay. So here's just to sum it up: the control is the security rule implementation specification that plugs a vulnerability. So in this case, a hurricane is the threat and the vulnerability is the absence of the control. So in this case, no disaster recovery plan. Once you identify that and you mitigate it with a disaster recovery plan, you are in much better in a much better situation than you would have been without it. So Expresso solves the equation. You you assign the subjective levels for the risk, the threat, the vulnerability, you determine the impact, and then you can run a report that tells you what risks are, are there that you need to mitigate. And so, as Carlos said, you would start with the high risks. Espresso also allows you to put place notes for risks, so you can say, hey, this particular risk, this is what we've done, this is, you know, uh, other things that we need to consider, so the notes become a really, really powerful feature that you can yes. attach the risk, that you can attach the security objects, because this is kind of unstructured data that you probably don't have a system where you can actually put it, right? It's in somebody's head or it's in somebody's on, on the PC in some document somewhere that no one knows. And so if the person that ha has it is on vacation or, God forbid, got hit by a Mack truck, Nobody can find it, so people are finding, our clients, our customers are finding that the notes feature of Espresso, of being able to annotate risk with, you know, uh, all kinds of organization-specific things uh, is really, really useful and important to them. Well, yeah, because one of the things that, that, that I've talked to them about was being able to print the report that, you know, shows their uh, risk assessment, and then has the notes there. So if you're, you're at a high risk but you've got someone working on it, you can specify this person is working on it, it should be done by this date, or if it's already complete, you have it listed as completed by thus and such a date and tested in the document itself, because you have to show documentation for VDE, as Carlos would say, your visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, you would have the location of where that file is stored. So Expresso allows you to do lots of nice things like that. Um, and, and that's why we say you can get in there and do your risk assessment. Here's an example. You have your baseline risk assessment that comes directly populated with the system. Then you go in and you identify what your threat vulnerability, TB probability is, high, medium, or low, the impact, the impact level, and then the overall risk level. Let me, let me just say something about this report, right? Because when I'm doing due diligence on behalf of a customer, you know, and, and, and let's say a covered entity says, hey, I want to hire this business associate. They say that they're in, uh, they say that they're in HIPAA, they're HIPAA compliant, all right? And, I'm like, okay, well, let's ask them just a few basic questions to see just how compliant they are, right? Because if they fail on these few basic questions, then you know what I mean? They're lying, essentially, right? They're 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 not they're not compliant. So 
you know, and, and so we ask easy questions to start with, like, do you have a named security officer? Do you have a named privacy officer? Um, and one of the things I'm going to ask is, show me your last risk assessment, okay? Now, if I get back some kind of questionnaire that you answered, or, you know, in one case, I got back an empty template for a risk assessment, that's what the documentation is that they provided, right? Well, I know you haven't done a risk assessment. Or if I, I, I'm not, and I'm, if I'm an HHS auditor, I'm not going to accept some questionnaire as a risk assessment because you didn't implement a rigorous process like identifying threats with vulnerabilities and linking them up with controls. Okay, you took some easy fill out these 20 questions and called it a risk assessment. And I'm here to tell you that that's not a risk assessment, that that game, that game may have played five years ago, 10 years ago, but we're in an entirely different world. Even if you're a small business associate or covered entity, you better be able to produce some documentation that you did a, a risk assessment, okay, with threats and vulnerabilities, et cetera, the way NIST recommends that you do one, okay? And to the degree, you don't need to do a perfect risk assessment. It's not about perfection. It's about getting started, showing some visible demonstrable evidence and iterating over time so that you improve your compliance narrative, right? And the way you comp your story, right? And not like story as in it's some fabrication is your, your story, your narrative is you've gotten better and better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying, okay? Uh, the other thing I might say when this is the easy stuff is show me your, your training spreadsheet. Show me when you trained your entire staff. All right, I want to see that. Either you produce a database report, show me a spreadsheet, show me something, right? And often, the, the, those business associates, um, in the cases where I've done this, they can't do it, right? They're essentially, they're essentially um, lying about their HIPAA compliance, right? And you as a covered entity, or even if you're a business associate and you got a subcontractor, having a BAA is not enough. You have, you have to do a more than have a BA. Do you have to go on site, monitor their operations? No. But what you have to do, the due diligence you have to do, is at least ask them for some evidence that they're in compliance. And if they can't give you basic evidence, well, then you know. Because what's going to happen is if there's a breach, right, and there's a lawsuit or there's an HHS audit, HHS is going to come back to you and say, did you get satisfactory assurances from your business associates? And you say, well, we have a business associate contract. Well, that's not enough, okay? That's not enough. So you don't have to visit, you don't have to monitor their operations, but you better get some visible demonstrable evidence from them that they're complying because now after the High Tech Act, they got to comply statutorily uh, with the regulations in the same way that a covered entity does. So um, something like this is, you know, you, you're going to be asked for it. Okay. So, so the risk assessment report will give you all of the risks that you have that are high, medium, and low, and you may want to sort them, have the high ones addressed first, and then move on to the medium and low. So we say that the remediation process actually we provide you with tools to actually mitigate these risks in the HIPAA survival guide. And we have training, uh, obviously, that teach you how to go about mitigation. So having training, checklists, products, resources, policies, etc., those are some of the things that you would need to have in order to become compliant. Here's one, the security rule checklist scorecard, or the scorecards. Notice at the bottom it has a security rule, privacy rule, breach notification, and uh, cloud, social media, and mobile. So what we have here, as I described earlier, but it was too small to see, was the item to the left. It is a security rule, administrative uh, rule, specification part, number yeah. one. Dash 1A is a risk assessment, and you have to gather data in order to do the risk assessment. So these are coming from, these scorecards are actually mapping for the security rule, for the privacy rule, and for the breach notification rule, every single requirement of the rule, okay? And if you if you noticed, uh, 
the HHS audit protocol that they produced, the first one that they produced, right? We, we map the scorecard to every single requirement. So you can go give yourself a grade, all right, as to where you're at for each requirement. So not only are you getting sort of espresso and, and these remediation products, you're getting a way to keep score. You're getting a way to think about uh, and, and manage and have a, an underlying sort of philosophy of methodology of how you do compliance, okay, and how you show an auditor or court of law that you're making a good faith effort to comply and you can't show them if you're not keeping score of where you're at okay so we this is coming from our checklist our checklists cover every single one of the security rule requirements every single one of the uh, privacy rule requirements we have a security rule checklist a privacy rule checklist a breach notification framework and the breach notification uh, set of audit requirements is, are a little bit different because it's more, it's more preparedness it's more do you have model letters to send out to individuals? Do you have model letters to send out to the media? Do you have a methodology to help you determine whether or not you, you did have a breach? Okay, those are the kind of audit requirements that surround the breach notification rule, and and there are only about ten for those, right? So what we're what we're showing here is a, a methodology and a way of thinking about compliance and a way of showing how all these pieces of the puzzle fit, fit together in a way that you can show visible demonstrable evidence to uh, an HHS auditor, to a covered entity. If you're a business associate, you can say, hey, here, hey, look at our scorecards. Here's where we're at. You know, we're doing, I think we're doing a good job here. We could do a better job there, blah, blah, blah. Here we say, we give you a three, and a three, see this legend up there, three is functional. Okay, once you've done your baseline risk assessment, is it, is it perfect? No, but it is a baseline risk assessment that's, that has identified your high risk, right? So you've got something in place and it's working, right? Because now you're taking those high risks and you're remediating them, and that remediation is in this step, which is the risk management step. Simplify, protect, monitor, report, et cetera, and then go do and then assess again. Okay, that's sort of the repetitive loop of the risk management control. Okay, really in some ways that risk management control swallows the entire rule. So these checklists become an important way of seeing how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. And in those cases where I get involved sort of from my law firm perspective, the checklist is kind of where I start because once people look at this, they, the light comes on and they say, oh, I get it. I get it. And see so you. Here for remediation, those are references to our checklist, and our checklist for every requirement give you three things: the policy for this requirement, okay, the processes that should underpin this requirement, and the way you should be able to track process results. So if you have policies, processes, and ways to track process results for every requirement then you have visible demonstrable evidence for every requirement, then you're in compliance. That's how you define compliance. Do you have VDE for each requirement? Most covered entities and business associates, and, and I, would, uh, I don't want to denigrate uh, our listeners, but I bet most of you can't even tell me what all the requirements are, let alone have a spreadsheet that says, yeah, we're doing good here, we're doing not so good here. Exactly. You know, it's, so these are fundamental 101 things. You've got to be able to know what the requirements are before you can comply with them, right? Before you can even start giving yourself kind of a scorecard as to where you're at. Okay. And the, rem the remediation tool gives you even more information about the how to go about doing that. We get the, the security rule gives you the what, and the remediation tools give you the how. So on those pages within the security rule checklist, you'll find the information that Carlos described about the processes, procedures, and tracking mechanisms. But we also have another column related where you may have additional related information and we refer you to that. Here's the privacy, a piece of the privacy rule checklist scorecard. And again, it has the same type of items, description, how you score yourself, 
What do you use for remediation and better understanding of how to implement the rule and related information regarding the rule? Breach notification, as Carlos said, is a little bit different. So there's a framework um, and actually there is a notification user's guide for describing the content of how the notification process works. Cloud, social media, and mobile, same thing. We have the items, the descriptions, the score, the remediation tools, and related information. Now, one thing, one thing I want to say about the cloud, social media, and mobile, these are really sort of um, a subset of the privacy rule and a subset of the security rule, but there's such an important nuanced area that we decided we needed, and it would be good to have its own scorecard because it's got nuanced issues that we wanted to highlight. Okay, it's not a separate rule. HHS doesn't have separate audit requirements for cloud, social media, and mobile, right? Their audit requirements cover the three rules, privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule. But this is such an important area from, you know, from cloud and how you protect yourself on the cloud, uh, how you protect, how you ensure that your uh, uh, EHR vendor is not going to go out of business. If they do, what do you do? You know, uh, uh, social media issues. You know, posting uh, patient pics on Facebook, mobile, bring your own device. I, I mean, these three areas are uh, so nuanced and complex that we thought we would develop a scorecard uh, for this and special remediation products that would help you deal with these issues. So it's a subset of the other stuff, but it's a really it's an important and nuanced subset. Okay. So we said first we do our risk assessment, then we identify the high risks, we remediate, and then we repeat. So we may find that there are additional risks that we hadn't thought about before, and it may involve different vulnerabilities as well, because the risk, as you remember from the equation, is the combination of a TV pair, the threat and vulnerability, times the impact to your organization. So you can have multiple separate risks depending on what comes up as you do your subjective analysis. So we said that you don't have to put your security objects in first. You can do your baseline risk assessment in a short amount of time. That assumes that you understand what your environment is, what you have in place, what you don't have in place. And then you can begin putting in your security objects, which would be assets, inventory, person, places, processes, or items of other items of value. So here's an example of some of the things that people might put in for clinical networks, devices, the, the various types of security objects that might be put in to the system and evaluated. The next thing that you do is you're going to assign risks to each of these devices. But again, that's a long, longer, much longer process. You're not only gathering that information, but now you're actually having to say, okay, or these devices. Actually, Debbie, let me let me interrupt you a little bit. Um, what you what you end up doing, what you end up doing once you have your your security objects in Espresso is you, you don't assign you, you do assign risk, but indirectly, what you're assigning, what you're what you're saying in Espresso is we're going to apply these controls that we have identified to these security objects. All right. Yes. So controls in the real world. Are, 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 are assigned or associated with uh, security objects, right? So if you have a network, you set your firewall you know, ports in a particular way. You set your routers in a particular way. That means that you're applying controls that you identified in your risk assessment to the real world objects that you're trying to protect, right? Whether it's your network, whether it's your devices, whether it's your people, whether it's your rooms, where you have you know, card access, 
video cameras, all those are controls that are being applied to real, real world objects, okay? And that's the connection that you're making once you have your inventory in place, that's what you're saying. You're saying, hey, this is how, for these objects, this is how we are controlling them. We, 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 are, we are attacking the problem uh, with these controls. And in, in the way that the, um, the security objects have been identified and, and separated out, as Carlos mentioned earlier, you can actually apply a control to a group of devices as opposed to having to do each one individually. So you may say that all devices have to have um, have to have encryption, for example. And so that control would be put on all those devices. You may even change and for some for the PC then or for the phone you, you apply something else. In yeah, addition, well we don't, I'm sorry, David, what we don't have here and what would be useful for, for next time we do this is a, a slide that shows uh, that for, for security objects, we break it down into category, okay, and then class, right, and then the single object. So I'll give you an example. A category could be, um, a, a, a category could be devices, right, and then underneath devices, you would have a class called PCs, and then obviously you would list all your PCs on, on, under that category class, okay? And then you could apply a control to an individual PC, to all PCs at the class level, or you could apply the control to uh, the entire category, or you could apply the control globally to every security object you have, like maybe a disaster recovery plan is applied globally every security object because it's it's that type of control that's true that's true so here you go every security object is generally assigned a control and here's an example of I don't know how well you can see it but up here we're in security objects devices PCs we have two PCs that have been entered into the system and with the controls that we have put into place We've identified these risks, these vulnerabilities, and these threats. In the system as well, in, in Expresso, if, when you're going through and you want to look at, well, okay, here's something that it says, I need to regularly review records of information system activity, such as audit logs, access reports, and security incident tracking reports. Well, where does that come from? What is the authority? that says that I need to have this control in place. And you have a clickable item here where you can go directly to the, the security rule specification online and you can read. I had a question that um, someone asked me, well, Deb, what is an in incident? Incident tracking was the, was the requirement. And as a nurse, an incident could be that you uh, gave out the wrong medication to a patient. Well, when we took a look at actually what it said in the regulations, it was totally something different. So there may be times when you're going through this that you say, I, I really don't understand what they're asking about. And so you're able to actually go and click directly to the regulations because we have them online at the HIPAA Survival Guide. Then we right. have- these are, these are the controls. This is actually the, what we call the authority what is it making you do this? Well, this 164.308A12D, and when you click on that, you're taken to the HIPAA Survival Guide where we have the full text of what that control says, right? So if you're confused and you want to go out there and look at it and you want to see the authority, you can do that from within Expresso. You look, you look at the control and say, oh, this, this vulnerability says that it's plugged by this control. I'm not really sure what that control is. You click on that, and, and you get uh, you get to the source, essentially the source code, the regulation itself. And then we have under there any particular products that we might be able to um, also provide additional information. Right, and what we're doing here is we're pointing. Go back one, Debbie. We're pointing you to other content that we have that talks about this control.
okay, and this CSC comes from the Cybersecurity Council, and they have 20 mission critical controls, and we're also saying, you know what, go look at this, because it's, it's, it's basically the same thing. All right, so we're just giving you more information about this kind of control. Okay, so here, if you would have clicked on that, it would have taken you right here to the administrative safeguards, and we would go down to D. Here's information system activity review required. Implement procedures to review records of information activity, such as audit logs, access reports, and security incident tracking reports. So this is where it would take you, what it might look like. Okay, okay. well... Hopefully that gave you an idea of the compliance equation. We and covered a lot of ground. Back of... to you, Carlos. Right, so Martin, if you give me back the screen, but we've covered a lot of ground. Do we have some questions? We have uh, one question: Are the scorecards in Expresso? The scorecards are part of our subscription plan, right? So when you when you buy our subscription plan, it's twenty four ninety five essentially $2,500 a year for the first year and $1,295 for optional for renewals, you um, you get not only Expresso, you get all our um, you get all our mitigation products. Uh, so I'm going to uh, skip here to um, where we're at now because we've covered a lot of ground. So uh, and we, we, the rest of this, we're going to cover pretty fast. So, I, I would rather take more questions. But yes, you get the you get the scorecards when you buy uh, the subscription plan. Anything else? That's it for the moment. Okay. So, what do we mean by the legal technical divide? Okay. And here's an example. Okay. These are coming from the Center for uh, Internet Security Controls, the CSC. They have what they call their top 20 mission uh, uh, controls, but you know, let's say you implemented an inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices. Well, that sounds like yeah, that sounds like what you need to do for a risk assessment. But you know what? Nobody's going to ask you. No auditor is going to come in and say, "Hey, did you do CSC control number one?" No, they're going to say, "Did you implement a risk assessment?" Because that because under HIPAA. Legally, that's the requirement that you have to meet. They're going to say, did you implement 164.308A12A? Okay? And so despite the fact that you, you technically may be doing more or less the same thing, legally, you're, it's a whole different ballgame. You have to answer a different question. It's not a technical thing you're doing. It's this legal requirement. Did you implement this requirement? Not a requirement from the uh, from the CSC that may be similar to it. Okay, now I'm, I'm not saying that if you did something similar, it wouldn't help you. It still may help you, but it's not the same as uh, doing the uh, complying with the legal requirement. They're really they're really two separate things. Now it's a good exercise to be able to map these things because cybersecurity is cybersecurity is cybersecurity. It's really doesn't vary that much. But legally, it varies a lot. Legally, it matters. Okay, and same thing with PCI DSS. You can map a lot of these technical requirements. And I have people that say, "Hey, I've done all this PCI DSS. Aren't I compliant with HIPAA?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> you're not, because legally, you haven't met these other requirements, these process requirements, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. The mapping is not exactly the same, and so the legal requirement is not going to be met, even though you implement it. The technical requirement okay and when we talk about a wicked problem we talk about wicked as in hard to solve okay and this is the compliance narrative what you want to be doing is building a good narrative over time which is being getting better and better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence with full compliance being this aspirational goal that you may never get to HIPAA is not this one set and forget anymore you can throw that out the window. That's old school HIPAA when it was a paper tiger. That's not how cybersecurity works. Cybersecurity now is a lifetime challenge because the bad guys are getting smarter on a daily basis. You may never get the full compliance. That's an aspirational goal. And 
legally, there's no requirement that you be absolutely there. Legally, the, what's requirement is not perfection, but it is are you improving your compliance narrative, okay? So what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce risk, right, through risk assessment to levels that are reasonable and appropriate, not perfect. And we're trying to, as a practical matter, Katrina-proof your practice, okay? You have to recognize that most compliance projects fail because of people and process organizational challenges, not because of security rule challenges, right? And a security rule implementation, you really need to think about this as a change project, which means changing how your organization thinks about compliance and learning how to effectively manage risk, right? That's a big part of the change. And what we say is, and what our products uh, try to do, is implement an agile methodology. Okay, which means you're going to do this iteratively over time. You can't eat, you can't boil the ocean. If you try to boil the ocean, you're going to fail, right? So what is agile compliance? Just a, at a high level, agile compliance is a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach. Now, software development industry, right, the software industry has adopted agile, and that's, that's the religion now in software, but agile, this, this iterative problem-solving is now being adopted uh, broadly across different functional areas and definitely applies to compliance. And we've been singing the agile sort of, and you know, carrying the agile flag for a long time now. It's iterative, fail forward fast because, because really you don't know what you're doing, but in healthcare, which is a industry based on science and the, the scientific method, and testing a, hypo a hypothesis, et cetera, et cetera. Failing is anathema, right? You can't fail. Lives are at risk. Yet, with respect to compliance, fail forward fast is the philosophy. Why? Because it's the only effective way of solving a wicked problem, which is w wicked. Why? Because it's organizationally and social, socially complex. And believe it or not, you don't even understand the problem that you're solving until you start solving it because each organization is different. The way you implement HIPAA in your organization and the challenges you face with your budget resources, crazy, grumpy docs and all of that is gonna be different than the next organization. And there's no stopping rule. You're never gonna stop. Since there's no definitive problem, you haven't really defined the problem, like we're not building a bridge. We don't know exactly what the problem is. The problem is HIPAA compliance. Well, what is that? Well, even going through this presentation, it probably, you know, raised more questions than answers. And the solutions aren't right or wrong. They're just better than others or worse or good enough. Okay, so Agile, really the takeaway is that big problems like HIPAA compliance are going to require many, many small solutions. Get started. That's why we say get started with a baseline risk assessment. Do it in three hours or less. Identify those high risk areas and get busy remediating and get busy learning about the problem that you're trying to solve in your organization. So big problems are gonna require many, many, many small solutions, right? The best thing you can do is get started. Well, it's not old school compliance with this government, risk management. That was this formal academic model, it's a static model. It viewed risk as a necessary evil to be contained. And now you should, re you should view compliance as part of your value proposition. Part of what you do that adds value to and enhances the patient experience. It's just part of privacy and security is part of what you do to benefit your customers, which are in, in the healthcare industry, your patients. So it turns out that the soft stuff, right? Because this is soft stuff. This is management philosophy. This is, you know, uh, organizational theory. This is the soft stuff. Really, it's the hard stuff. It's not the technical stuff. That is that that really holds up pro, uh, projects. And John, I'll let you weigh in a little bit because I know you've got a lot of experience here, and we've covered a lot of ground. So, you know, I'll, we're getting ready to do a shameless plug here. So maybe you want to just, you know, kind of uh, summarize and jump in and add your add your thoughts here. Well, yeah, as, as somebody who's worked in technology for 30 years, my short version of what Carlos just said is, technology is easy. People are tough. So that soft stuff is the hard part because emotions and philosophy and all those other things are involved. It's not just zeros and ones. But at TechFact, we approach our uh, customers with is, is that we're their partner and their advocate. 
and we want to do what's best for them and to help them understand or fully un understand and appreciate the risks that they may have at their business, whether it's technical, human factors, uh, environmental, uh, market strategies, whatever, because we are first business people and technology just happens to be our subject matter expert expertise. Um, and it is a tool, technology is a tool, it's a very important tool, um, but it, with it comes lots of risks, just like every employee that you hire or every contractor that you bring on, brings on inherent risks that you have to address at some level. So at TechFact, when we are engaged to do a security assessment, we're gonna use some tools that help us look at your vulnerabilities and uh, risk factors from inside your organization, as well as outside the company, you know, penetration tests and that sort of thing, and then help you develop a holistic view of what your risk and 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 and, and uh, the the big items are using you know the equation, and then to address the big ones, um, not just the easy ones, the ones that are easy to fix. I mean, remediation is necessary. You know, at a number of levels, but you have to, you know, be committed to what I call sort of continuous process improvement. That, that's all security in this. The the new HIPAA is is called sort of, That's all is. It is a commitment to continuous process improvement. Doesn't mean exactly. things are ever going to get perfect, but that exactly. that commitment is what you have to demonstrate to get uh, that you're you're trying to be compliant. Yeah, I like that. People are uh, technology is easy. People are tough. That that's a good. That's a really good summary of uh, of that. And TechFact, it, TechFact uh, is kind of our technology partner. You know, not kind of is our technology partner for actually on the ground helping you if you need that sort of help. So we talked about Espresso. We you know we have Espresso as part of our subscription plan. You heard a lot about these reports. Uh, what you haven't heard uh, probably is that we uh, are, are announced and have been for the last couple of months something called, uh, I'm going to back up a little bit, Heartbeat, okay, and it, which is compliance as a service, which is uh, going to be delivered uh, in, in cases where you want technical expertise, you need more than our content, you need more than Espresso, you actually need a technology partner, that's where TechFact comes in. And they have a set of services that they can customize for you depending on your environment, right? And we call that compliance as a service, but it's not this magic solution in the cloud. It's actually hands-on professional services that understand both the technology and right and the regulations. You need that com that intersection of knowledge in order to be able to deliver uh, a solution, right? So. This SAS, this uh, compliance as a service heartbeat that is really a tech fact offering is going to be administered by HIPAA certified professionals, okay, tech fact staff and technical staff that are certified in the regulations, right, and the, and the, and attorneys when required, okay. So obviously I practice in this space, but you may have your own attorneys that practice in this space. Pulse is something else that we're announcing, and that's really just an entry point. Pulse is part now of the subscription plan, optional, but it's free. And what, what Pulse will do is TechFact will come and do a network scan for you, okay? Load some software, let it run, identify your vulnerabilities, and come back and, 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 um, and show you reports as to, you know, what you should be doing. You, this firmware is out of date. You don't have to be patched. Here's an inventory of all the stuff that we found on this segment of your network, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's not going to boil the ocean. It's going to take an example. Okay, give us what, which network, which department, which, which satellite office, pick one, and we're going to do this analysis for you as part of your subscription plan, okay? And it's, a, it's a, you know, calculated to be about a $700 value. You imagine you got uh, expensive professional services, knowledgeable people, coming in, installing software, running that software, coming back, doing analysis, it's a fair amount of work, okay? We're offering that to you free as part of the subscription plan, delivered by TechFact, 
but it's optional. You, I mean, you don't have to do it. I mean, some people may be scared of having somebody. They don't want to know where the bodies are buried, right? Now, you should want to know where the bodies are buried, right? Because, because sooner or later, uh, it's not a question of, uh, you know, are you going to have a breach? It's when. It's going to happen. Wanna cry is going to get you. Petya is going to get you. Or the next evolving thing is going to get you. That's not going to stop, right? So you need to know where the dead bodies are. This is a start. This is a start that comes with our subscription plan. Now, if you want to do more serious stuff after that, like John mentioned, if you want to do SQL penetration, I mean, SQL, SQL injection testing, you want to do penetration testing, if you want to do all these other things, well, then that's outside of the scope of the subscription. You don't get that free. We're not, we don't have no PFM button that we push and, and you just get all that stuff. But TechFact will work with you to deliver those services. But I tell a lot of people, look, why are you worried about penetration and SQL injection when you don't even have the 101 basics covered? Let's get the basics covered first, okay? And then, then let's worry about penetration testing, SQL injection, and all that other stuff uh, that you read about, right? So this is Pulse. It's a network scan. It's free as part of the subscription plan. It's optional if you want to do it. Obviously, you guys probably know we sell the uh, HIPAA Sur Survivor Guide subscription plan for $24.95, optional $12.95, renewal. We believe that we provide the recipe, the how-to, not just the ingredients. Okay, This is not just a bunch of products thrown together. You saw with the scorecards and the checklist a system for doing compliance, a methodology for doing compliance, right? a way of thinking about compliance, not just a bunch of products that you get. Okay, so we like to think that we provide educational products that you can start executing on day one, right? You can do your risk assessment, set up a, an appointment after you buy a subscription, and in, in three hours or less, you probably have your baseline risk assessment. Is it perfect? No. Do you have all your security objects in it? No. But you have a risk assessment, a valid risk assessment, okay? There's no requirement, legal requirement for a perfect risk assessment. You've now got a risk assessment. You're not in willful neglect for that particular thing, right? So we, we believe we have agile compliance products that help you iterate, okay? And it's agnostic as to whether you're a business associate or covered entity. Our products apply to both. I think it's wetware, not just software, not just content, wetware, which is, it's, it, we believe that our products are knowledge transfer vehicles. We're trying to get you smart in HIPAA, right? So we're trying to enable your literacy so you can climb that curve. Uh, that's the shameless plug. Thank you for uh, staying with us this long. We went over a little bit over an hour and a half, but I'm going to open it back up, Martin, if, if there's any any questions. No, there are no questions at this time, but I wanted to point out something that was in the um, civil penalties. Someone uh, got fined $400,000 for having out-of-date business associate agreements. and. I wanted to reinforce your point that you know you should do them on on a quarterly basis or, or at least uh, a year. But if you had done them on a quarterly basis, you would have caught that. Right. If you have if you have you, you had to redo your business associate agreements after the omnibus rule came out in 2013. So if you have an old business associate agreement that dates prior to 2013 you're in willful neglect. You're going to get a $50,000 fine per violation, okay? Which means if you had 20 business associate ag agreements that were out of date or 50, uh, then you got 50 times 50,000 just for that particular violation, okay? And some people believe that there's a $1.5 million limit to the no fines. That $1.5 million limit is just per identical violation. So identical violation would mean you might have 100 business associate agreements that are out of date, okay? But if you have these 20 other different violations, then you can get whacked for those too. So theoretically, there is no limit, uh, no obvious limit to the amount of uh, CMP that HHS can impose upon you. It is definitely not 1.5 million. That's that's misleading because most people don't understand that is one. That's a 1.5 million max for uh, a, a a an identical violation. 
let's say you had a hundred thousand or a million records, okay, uh, in a breach. Well, you're going to max that out because each record is an identical violation. You're going to max that out at 1.5 million. Okay, you can easily max that out. But when they come do an audit, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan, if you haven't trained your people, if you don't have a named security officer, then for each one of those separate violations, you're going to get whacked as well, right? They're not included in the 1.5 max. They're they're uh, different. Uh, they stand on their own. So um, anyway, one more time, Martin. With that, and no 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 questions. Thanks for hanging with us. Uh, we, we do have one question. What where is that for boiling the ocean? Uh, no, it's for uh, it's for boiling uh, Clearwater Beach, or uh, pick a pond close to you. It's for boiling that. Uh, what it's not it's not for boiling the ocean. Uh, that, there is no boiling the ocean. If we you know boiling the ocean is the antithesis of agile. Right, we, we that's that's where we started. That was a great question, but you got to start eating this elephant a little bit at a time, or you're never going to eat the elephant, right? So, uh, no, wetware is just you know uh, a a word that I heard coined way back before I started practicing law about five lifetimes ago when I was in the tech industry to describe how tacit knowledge knowledge that are that's in someone's head is transferred to other people, right? It's transferring from my gray matter to your gray matter. And so, you know, how, you know, frankly, I'm trying to be clever with it and say, that's what our products attempt to do. They attempt to do transfer of, of, of our team's tacit knowledge that's in our heads uh, into these documents to your gray matter. That's all the questions we have, Carlos. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, we do these once a month, usually on the third Thursday. Uh, remember, accept no substitutes. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.